or a debit. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now that's sort of counterintuitive. That's not what you expect because most of us are accustomed to viewing trials as, as negatives. Trials are, are, are definitely uh, not the sort of thing that, that you want. They're, they're, they're not credits, they're, but they're, they're absolutely debits, aren't they? Well, again, not so quick. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And then following the comma, you have the word for. And if you follow the logic of this passage right through to the end, you'll notice that for is answering the question, why in the world would you consider a trial a credit? Why in the world would you count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds? He gives three answers in these verses, and I'll just give you three answers as well. I don't want to add to or take from what James has done. The the first answer is because of what we know. You see where I got that? I'm not that clever or inventive to just kind of, you know, come up with stuff out of thin air. It's got to come right from the text because of what we know. Interesting word here, no. There are two types of knowledge. There's the type of knowledge that is acquired educationally. You put on your uniform, you go to school, you sit in the class, and you learn. You acquire knowledge educationally. There are lectures, there are exams, there are essays, there are tutorials, But you learn, you acquire knowledge educationally. Now, there's another kind of education, another kind of knowledge. It's the knowledge that is acquired not primarily educationally, but it's acquired primarily experientially. You ever heard of someone who graduated from the school of hard knocks? You ever heard of the person who, you know, sort of learned things the hard way? They didn't learn them sitting at a desk in a classroom, but they learned them amidst the cut and thrust of daily living. It's experiential knowledge. Now, the thing that you might want to know is that the New Testament word here, know, is not one or the other. It's both and. It's those things that we learn educationally. We meet here on a Sunday, 10 in the morning, 4 in the afternoon. We gather together on a Tuesday, 1.45 in the afternoon, 8 in the evening. We have a ladies' Bible study. We have other opportunities to hear the Word of God. We're trying to learn. We're trying to grow. We want to know. But then there's also this knowledge which is acquired experientially, just in the living of life, just in the things that you go through, the things that you face. And you're learning how what you're learning educationally interfaces with what you're going through experientially. And the end result is you come to know some things. And the thing here primarily that you come to know is that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now you may just want to underline the word steadfastness because it appears again and again in the text, either steadfastness or also a steadfast a bit later. And it says the testing of your faith is, uh, of your faith is actually productive. It produces steadfastness. And you should let steadfastness have its full effect. Let it, its work be completed in you. That you may, this is a purpose clause, that you may be perfect. Now this is not like moral, ethical perfection, but this is like completeness. This is maturity. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in 
nothing. And you say, that's kind of wordy. So what is it actually that we know? We know that God is working in our trials to produce spiritual maturity. That's what we want, isn't it? If we're a Christian, that's what we want. If we know and love and follow uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we want spiritual maturity. We want to be perfect. We want to be complete. We want it to be able to be said of us that we're lacking in nothing. Well, how does that happen? Well, it's like this. You'd be very happy to sign up for a course. If you could only attend the lectures when it was convenient. When you had nothing else on. When you had nothing else that conflicted with it in any way. You'd be very happy to sign up for a course where you never had to sit an exam. You never had to write an essay. You never had to uh, answer questions from uh, the lecturer or the, uh, the teacher. Basically, what you do is you just sort of breeze in and out at will, listen, learn a bit, and someone says, how you doing? Oh, I think I'm doing fine. Never a test, never an exam, never an opportunity to find out if you really are learning and growing and maturing. (laughs) Problem is, a lot of people think that Christianity is a course and they think that it's that sort of course. You know, you just turn up to church from time to time and you listen to the person up front. Uh, You don't ever have to write anything down. You don't ever have to remember anything. You don't ever have to really study. You don't have to, you know, sit an exam or you don't have to write a paper. It's all just sort of, you know, easy. And someone says, well, are you growing? Well, yeah, I think so. Are you learning? Yeah, I I feel like I am. Christianity is not like that. There are exams. There are tests. No, the tests are not a paper, you know, where you have to, you know, sit in exam-like conditions and get a certain number of marks within a certain period of time. But you do have tests. And those tests are a means of revealing... The teacher already knows what you know or don't know. The tests are a means of making known to you whether or not you are growing and maturing and developing and learning as much as you think you are. Don't despise the test. Uh, Don't resent the trial. Don't have the attitude, well, this is not what I signed up for. I had enough trials before I became a Christian. I became a Christian so some of my trials would go away. Well, indeed, some of them will. But there'll be some new ones that'll take their place. Because we're not home yet. There are lessons we still need to learn. There are truths we still need to assimilate. There are areas in which we need to continue to grow. And when we realize that the various kinds of trials that we meet in this life are the divinely appointed means of developing and producing spiritual maturity within us, we come to realize that's not a debit. That's, That's a credit. That's not something that's to my harm. That's something that's actually... For my good. So how can you or why should you count it all joy when you meet various kinds of trials? Well, because of what you know. But not only because of what you know. We'll look to the next screen. Also because of what you have received. Because of what you have received. Let let, let me explain. 
If any of you lacks wisdom... Now, wait a minute. We've got to go back, Abigail. Perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Now, but if any of you lacks wisdom... Okay, there's something lacking. And what's lacking is wisdom. And so... Knowledge and wisdom, they're the same thing, aren't they? Mm, No, not at all. And if you lack wisdom, what do you need to do? How do you acquire wisdom? Notice what he does not say. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him age. You know, some people you know, have this idea, you know, that, you know, young people are, are foolish. You know, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And so the, the, the remedy for foolishness is, is just aging. Question, you don't have to have anyone in particular in mind, but do you know any old fools? Yeah, me too. So the answer is not just aging. In fact, the... The answer is not aging at all. The the answer is asking. Let him ask God. And and here's what you do when you ask God. This is what you know. You know that he gives generously to all without reproach. It's a wonderful thing when you know some things about God. He's not paying a debt. He's giving a gift. He's not doing so with a miserly attitude, but he's doing so very generously. And it's not just to a select few, it's to all. Well, he's going to help you, but he's probably going to beat you up in the process and make you feel bad for needing the help. No, he's going to do so without reproach, and it will be given him. And what, what, what is the if there? It is wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And he gives generously to all without reproach. And it, that is, the wisdom which he lacks will be given him. But be sure, ask in faith, no doubting. One who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven, tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will, there's our word, receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So it's not just what we know. But it is also what we have received. We need a a bit of wisdom about our trials. Especially since we seem to have so many of them. If we don't have any wisdom about them, we're going to doubt and question the character of God. We're going to doubt and question uh, His goodness. We're going to doubt and question his faithfulness. We need some real uh, wisdom. <laughs> uh, Chuck Swindoll uh, tells about uh, a lady and her pet squirrel. Now, um, the, the Bartons uh, have, have a lovely dog. I don't think you need a pet squirrel uh, to go with uh, this uh, dog. Uh, but this a particular story that uh, Chuck Swindoll tells is about a lady with a pet squirrel and she wasn't married she didn't have any children and her 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 squirrel was uh well sort of like a member of the family and she knew that squirrels like nuts and particularly that squirrels like walnuts and so she wanted to supply her squirrel with all the walnuts he could possibly desire. So she went to the supermarket and she saw there in the supermarket where she could buy these walnuts. And she knew from her own experience, because, you know, if you've got walnuts, you've got to have a, a nutcracker because, you know, the, uh, the, the, the shell of that uh, walnut is, is, is well, it's quite tough. And, you know, you've got you to be able to crack it in order to get to the flesh there, in order to get to the nut. And she said, oh, I couldn't have my squirrel doing that. And so she found some in the supermarket that were already shelled. They were just in a little, you know, plastic bag. And all she had to do was then just give them to the squirrel, right, left and center. And the squirrel thought he had died and gone to squirrel heaven. It was, it was great, you know, just getting, you know, these, these 
you know, walnuts and having no effort, uh, expending no energy whatsoever just to enjoy them. But in time, the, the squirrel uh, seemingly lost interest in the walnuts. And in fact, the squirrel didn't eat them at all. The squirrel started losing weight. They're not very large to start with. And so it's losing weight, becoming weak, and lethargic. Okay, it's time to go to the vet. He go to the vet. The vet does an examination. What's the problem? Anyone know? It's actually the process of cracking the nut, cracking the shell, getting out the flesh that sharpens in one sense, one set of squirrel teeth and keeps the other part of the squirrel's teeth set from growing too long because when its teeth grow too long and when its teeth are not sharpened, guess what? It can no longer eat. And so this lady loved her squirrel. She loved her squirrel to death. Wisdom will say to us that we require things to sharpen us. We require things to shape us. We require things to help us grow and mature into godliness and Christ-likeness and greater submissiveness to the Holy Spirit. To deprive us of those things which are meant for our growth would not be love at all. And it certainly wouldn't be wise. Now, do you always see it that way? Well, of course you do when it's a squirrel. But what about when it's you? And have you ever wished that some of your trials would be taken off you? You know, some of your difficulties would just vanish, that you wouldn't have any of these, that you would have a life of all pleasure and ease, uh, all honey and no bees. Yeah, the only problem is those things are actually intended for our good. And you say, well, I just don't see it. Well, that's why he says if anyone likes wisdom, let him ask God. And so you ask God and he gives you this wisdom to recognize that your trials are an essential part of God's sharpening and shaping regime for your life. Okay, how are we doing? That's two out of three. It's not too bad. So the first one is what we know. The second one is what we've received. Let's move to the next screen. And let's see that the next thing here that we're going to do is seemingly go off topic. And one of the things that's going to become really kind of unnerving about James is you'll be following him and you'll just be every step, one right after the other. And then he inserts something and you think, well, how does that fit with what he was just talking about. Hold that thought because you're going to see that virtually every time he does that, he's dealing with a particular issue or a particular class and group of people. The rich. But we'll just read this. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat, withers the grass, its flower falls, its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Hold that thought. We'll come back to it in weeks to come. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Oh, that's more like it. 
That seems to follow naturally from what we were just talking about. The other does too, by the way. We just have to keep you in suspense a bit longer as to why and how. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. That's what we were talking about. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So what I'm setting before you this afternoon is that we can count it all joy because of what we know, because of what we have received, and because of what we believe. And what we believe is this, the promises of God. Blessed, that's the first word. It's the word makarios. Some of you remember, um, Pastor Steve will have led us through a, a study at one stage of the, of the Beatitudes. And a lot of times we think the Beatitudes are all in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, there are other beatitudes in the, the scriptures as well. Here's an example. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Why? For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Now, the Macarius word here, blessed, is the word which can actually be joyful or happy. And so he said, it is a matter of joy when you are led into uh, various kinds of trials. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Those, those are the same sorts of words he was using earlier. But here is what he wants us to believe. For when he has stood the test. So here's the promise. Your trial, regardless of how severe will not last always. Will it? No. There are times of trial. There are periods of difficulty. There are seasons of adversity. But your Trial will not last always. Do you believe this? Well, if you do, then you recognize this has come to me at this particular point in time and it's for my good and it's for God's glory and it's not going to last. It has an expiry date on it. But if you think... It's never going to end. It's always going to be this way. And when this passes, it'll just be taken, you know, its place will be taken by another. Well, there's no joy in that. But there's another, uh, there's another promise here. It's not just that it will not last always. It is that it will actually reveal something of who you are. Now, no, that's the problem many of us have. We don't really want anything to reveal what we actually are. You know, as long as everything's going along fine, you know, we appear to be nice and normal. And then we begin to have adversity and difficulty. And then, you know, the curtain is drawn and everyone sees what we're really like. This steadfast, our steadfastness, as we saw twice earlier in the text, is the ability of a fabric to retain its color without fading. And it's saying here that when we remain steadfast under trial, we are standing the test. And it is revealing something about who we actually are. So do you believe that your trial will end And do you believe that your trial will actually reveal the nature of your walk with God? Well, one of the things you'll discover as we're working through the letter of James is he's leading purposefully to chapter 5. And he'll begin introducing this in chapter 4, but he'll come into it very explicitly in chapter 5. A lot of this is helping us understand Job. 
and this question that we have from Job's experience about seemingly, seemingly unexplained suffering and seemingly unanswered prayer. And you'll remember that the term that he uses to describe Job is you remember the steadfastness of Job. And what was the issue there? The issue was, will a man be good for nothing? Uh, Satan said, no. Yeah, he's being good. Of course he is. You've given him plenty of money. He's got a big house and he's got a lot of power and he enjoys good health and he's got kids and everything is all right for him. Yeah, you take all of that away. Will a man be good for nothing? And God said, let's see. God knew. But he pulls the curtain. He takes all that Job enjoyed away. And Job went from enjoying to enduring in a single day. But his trial didn't last forever. There is a chapter 42 in Job. And we're seeing that at the end, the character of Job was revealed. He did stand the test. But he goes on and says, For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Wow. Any of you ever been to the Tower of London? I know the Shiptons lived there. They haven't just been there. But you've been to the Tower of London? You've seen the crown jewels? Uh, we're told that uh, Charles III, uh, though he's, he's our, you know, our, our king already, uh, that, that there, will be a, there will be a coronation. And, and that crown will be placed up, up on his head. That's quite an impressive thing indeed. But you know, this crown of life which is given to those who love the Lord is so great so valuable, so beautiful, so wonderful that if you have the king that sits, the the crown that sits upon the king's head and don't have this one, you're not rich, you're poor. You're not strong, you're weak. Those who stand the test will receive the crown of life. And how do we know this? Because God has promised it. And how has God promised it? To whom has he promised it? To the rich? To the strong? To the powerful? To the good? To the religious? Now he has promised this to those who love him. Question. Do you believe this? That, that's how it's evident that you love him. It's not, oh, you know, that you, you, know, you uh, talk about how much you love the Lord. You actually show that you love the Lord by when you're going through your darkest trials saying, this will not last. This will not last. When you're going through your most difficult trial, you're saying, this is just giving God the opportunity. You know, I... I I can't have a testimony without a test. You know, his glory cannot be made known. You know, this is the way that he's chosen to make his power uh, evident in my weakness, to make his wisdom uh, more apparent in my foolishness. And there's something better coming. There's something better coming. He's promised a crown of life. He's promised it to those who love him and who because they love him, they stand the test. So question, do you know these things? Have you received these things? Do you believe these things? If you do, you wouldn't put it in the debit column at all. It's all in the credit column. It's all for the good. It's all an occasion for joy. However, if you don't know these things, and if you haven't received these things, 
And if you don't believe these things, you're on your own. And how do you think that's going to work out for you? Not very good. Your trials are God's way of producing spiritual maturity in you. Your prayers are the means through which God gives you the wisdom that you need to live life and to make sense of everything that happens to you. And God has given promises. And if you believe those promises, you'll be saved. And not only will you be saved, you will be secured. And you will grow and you will mature. And by God's grace, in the end, you will be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. I pray by God's grace, you will know these things. You will receive these things. And you will believe these things for his glory. Well, let's stand as we sing our final